know, that dealing with rejection because I'm a sensitive guy. And uh, I had a tough time separating their no uh, to the hotel I was representing other than they were just saying no to me. But over time, I, uh, I, I knew if they weren't saying no, if they were saying no to me, then I was doing my job. I was doing my job. And I did sales for a couple of years and, and I had some success with it. Now, um, but I had learned about just really one facet of the hotel business. And I, um, I, I wanted to understand more about the business. And so I then took a job with the same hotel group and it was a hotel chain owned by a lady by the name of Leona Helmsley, who none of you have heard of, but in the uh, late 70s and 80s and early 90s, she was arguably the most recognizable face in the hospitality industry. And I worked for her. And I took a job as the night manager of one of her hotels. So I was 23 years old and I was in charge from 11 at night till 7 in the morning of a 300 room hotel on Central Park South with a couple of restaurants and uh, I learned a lot about the business doing that. So, you know, one of the jobs that, you know, you can get while you're still in school is a position called a night auditor. And I don't know if you're familiar with that title, but the night auditor is akin <coughs> to uh, the night manager. You're running that hotel during the graveyard shift, but you'll learn so much about the business. You'll learn a little bit about the financials. You'll learn a little bit about customer service because you're dealing with every guest. You may have to supervise a small staff. And it's an ideal way to really get a vibe for, is this something I want to do? And after doing that for a couple of years, it was something I wanted to do. And um, I applied for another job while I had this job. And they were building this hotel in New York. And it was, again, it would, had been in all the trade publications. And it was a hotel that Marriott was building. And it was going to be their flagship hotel. It's a hotel called the Marriott Marquis. And it's right in Times Square. So every time you look at any one of the New Year's Eve shows, um, typically it's right in front of that hotel. But this was in 1984, uh, 1985, when Times Square was not the beacon of tourism that it is today. It was really kind of a seedy place. Um, lots of uh, nefarious activity going on all around it. Um, but. Marriott had decided that they were going to be the first ones to get into Times Square and try to gentrify. You know, now, has anybody been to Times Square within the last five years? Been to New York, right? No cars drive through it anymore. You've got superheroes running around to take your picture, and it's all very sterile to a certain extent, and there's a big police presence. It was nothing like that in 1985. And uh, uh, and I don't mean it in a way that you may be thinking, okay, Boomer, we get you. Um, what I mean was, it was an early experience in changing an entire neighborhood. And you can see what it is today. And, and so I got a job with that hotel company as the uh, manager on duty there. And so here I was again, this time I'm 24 now, and uh, they've put me in a role where I'm in charge of the hotel again from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. I did that four days a week. And we had 1,600 rooms, uh, eight restaurants, uh, 47 floors, open atrium. And I couldn't help but learn more about the business that way. And, and I really felt like I was on my way. You know, this was my third real job in the industry. And I could feel like, at some point, you'll feel like, okay, this is, this is more than a series of gigs. This is really turning into a career. And it, it happened for me there in New York at the Marriott Marquis. 
and all kinds of crazy stuff happened there. I mean, you know, I could tell you a couple of stories that would just make your ears curl, but I'll tell you a happy story. So we, well, wasn't that happy. So uh, one of the mistakes they made when they built this hotel, I told you 1,600 rooms, it only had 250 parking spaces. And so we used to charge an arm and a leg for parking in 1984, five, I think we were charging $50 for overnight parking, right? Um, but there were only 250 spaces. There were other parking lots. So if a car had sat there for more than five days with no activity, we would call the owner and say, hey, just to remind you, uh, if it was somebody who wasn't in house because, um, or they had checked out. So we have a car, I shared an office with the parking garage manager. And so it was about 11 o'clock at night and I get a call, he says, hey Frank, we've got a car down here that's been down here for a week and we can't track down the owner and um, so we're going to tow it, which is what we did. So I said, okay, you guys get the paperwork get ready and I'll come down and sign off on it. And, we would let the police know that we were doing this. So they had a record of it so that if a guy showed up, he didn't think it was stolen. So uh, I get down there and the cops are there and there's the, my friend, the parking garage manager, and he's got the paperwork and I'm signing it. And I say to him, I said, have you opened up the car to see? Um, so he opens up the trunk and in the back of the trunk, and I kid you not, guys, because I can still see this now, there are six or seven big lawn leaf garbage bags filled with cash. Twenties, tens, hundreds. And I just looked at the parking garage manager, and I said, we'll talk in the office. And, and we got up there, and I was like, you know, and the cops took it away. And I said, couldn't have opened up that trunk before we had the cops there. <laughs> His name was Ken. I said, Ken, this could have changed our lives as we know it. So we wouldn't have had to take it all. I can still see it today. Right? The trunk opening. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that. We had we had a lot of different customer service issues in that place. You know, the front desk was on the eighth floor. So we had a lot of people who would just be confused roaming around on floors one through seven. And, and uh, but it's a beautiful hotel. If you ever get to New York, it's still beautiful. Uh, and it's, it's worth the look-see. So Marriott moves me to Chicago. And, and uh, I know this is all very exciting, but I, I want to tell you this. <laughs> Because one of the things you'll have to understand is that if you're in the hotel business and you're working for a bigger company, um, there's a really good chance that you're going to move. It's a highly transient sort of uh, business, meaning that you can do this. First of all, you can do these hospitality jobs anywhere on the planet you choose. That's a good thing. There is always going to be work. People are constantly traveling. People are constantly building new hotels. So there is always gonna be a need for people to work and manage hotels, always. Hotels have been around since we have recorded history. Uh, they started out as little inns and bed and breakfasts along the way as people were going between you know, uh, religious pilgrimages. So, when you, so when you're filling out applications for a company, I'm going to tell you one thing you need to do, whether you mean it or not. There's always a box that says, are you willing to relocate? And you've maybe seen that box as you've applied for something now. Whether you're willing to relocate or not, I would encourage you to check that box. Because if this is a career you want to be in, you're application, whether you get the job or not, it's going to go in your file. It's going to go in one pile or the other, right? And these bigger hotel companies and management companies and restaurant chains, 
They're looking for people who are willing to relocate because they continue to open up uh, establishments everywhere. And so whatever your ties are to Memphis, if you've absolutely got to be here, that's great. We've got a, we've got a robust hospitality economy here. But if you really want to grow and have new experiences and adventures, um, and your guys' generation is all about experiences and adventures, right? Right? Yeah. That's what I hear. You know, you, you want to experience and do things. So this is a great business to have those experiences uh, in, in different locations, not to manage, not to mention all of the different travel discounts that you'll get being affiliated with a hospitality company. Um, uh, we traveled for years, either you know, staying at hotels for nothing or for very little, and and uh, took that you take that for granted too. Um, so, you know, and you guys have a little bit of an uphill battle to a certain extent because people are saying things about your generation too. People are saying things like, anybody hear what they're saying about you guys? That they, how they're uh, lumping you all into one. What do they say about Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Z, millennials? Yes? Like we don't have communication skills? Yeah, you hear that. What else do you hear? Yes? That we're lazy, not trying hard enough. <laughs> trying hard enough. Anybody think of anything else? Yes? Very entitled. Oh, entitled. <laughs> what else? Anybody think of anything else? So, lousy communication skills, lazy, and super entitled. Right? 